a man dies and goes to hell. When he gets there, a demon processes his paperwork, checks him in, takes his passport, because he's never going to need that again, and then takes him on a tour of the facilities. <clears throat> he's told that new arrivals have an opportunity to select the room they'll spend their first thousand years in. So select wisely, because you can't change your mind after you're there. You have to have it for a whole thousand years. The first room the man is shown has everybody writhing in pain, boiling in oil, kind of like what you expect. No thank you, says the man. That doesn't look particularly comfortable. The second room has everybody standing around with loud rock music blaring from speakers just an inch away from their face and these lights blasting and flashing in irregular intervals to nauseating pattern. The man says, I don't like rock music, so I'd not send me to a different room. The third room has a whole bunch of people in it being attacked by wasps. No, 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 I'm allergic to wasps. The next room has a bunch of rats chewing on people. No, 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 I don't, I don't like rats. Uh, send me to a different room. The next room they go to has a whole bunch of people up against the wall standing on their heads with a pillow between their head and the floor, but, but standing on their heads. Oh, no thank you, I, I get headaches, let's try the next room. So they go to the next room, the door opens and he looks inside and it's a room full of people standing around in muck and excrement up to their navels. But they're all drinking coffee and eating Krispy Kreme donuts. Hmm, well the muck doesn't look too nice, but you know what, I love coffee and Drinking coffee for all eternity and eating Krispy Kreme donuts and not having to worry about my figure anymore, that looks like a great idea. Let's have this room. Are you sure? asked the demon. After all, you can't change your mind once you're in there. Yes, I'm sure. Well, then in you go. The man walks in, he wades into the muck and the excrement and he just, ugh, it's all slimy and warm and bubbly and he just, ugh, icky against his lower half. But... At least it only comes up to his navel, and he gets his coffee. Yes, it was espresso, extra strong. And, and the donut, oh, can I get one with sprinkles on it? Sure, here you go, says the demon. And he's sitting there in the muck and goo, and I wish I could sit down, but no. And he drinks his coffee and eats his donut, and after about five minutes, as they're talking with his neighbors, suddenly after five minutes, this demon comes in. Settles down in the middle of the mud, pulls out a bullhorn, and then says, Okay, everybody, coffee breaks over. Back on your heads. <coughs> <coughs> oh, cause you want to have to say hell. Yeah, that's right. It does. Hell. We're going to talk about hell today. But, Greg, Methodists don't talk about hell. No, we usually don't. You know, I... When I was a little child, I used to think, you know, boy, one of these days I'll get to be a preacher and then I can say the word hell in church and not get in trouble for it. Because when I said it as a kid, mother would often look at me sternly and then I would hear about it later in the day. And then I could become a Methodist pastor and guess what? We don't talk about hell. Oh. Well, lots of Christians talk about hell though. They spend a lot of time talking about hell. Describing hell, determining the people that they don't like who are going to go to hell. People with whom they disagree, people who don't look like them or talk like them or act like them or love like them. People who aren't part of their particular small little segment of the body of Christ. They know that they're going to hell. Never, never them, it's always the others who are going to hell. I'll, I'll never forget the folks from Westboro Baptist Church up in Topeka, Kansas protesting the General Conference in 2008 in Fort Worth, again in 2012 and 2016. Those people get around. Protesting, carrying signs, yelling and screaming at us, telling us, telling us how much God hated us. They didn't even bother telling us to repent. <laughs> they just wanted to make sure that we knew that God hated us and that we were all going to go to hell for daring to say, that God loves everyone. Imagine that. 
No, we don't like to talk about hell too much. And in that, we're pretty well in line with the Bible. Because, believe it or not, the Bible doesn't talk too much about hell. Huh, what, I thought that's what it was all about. Nope. Heaven is mentioned 622 times in the Bible. Hell is mentioned just 15 times in the Bible. Hades gets 12 mentions separate from hell. And a few of those hell references are parallel duplicates between Matthew and Mark uh, in our reading today from Jesus' statement about hell. That's actually the largest chunk, single chunk of them. It's what we've read today already. The Old Testament doesn't talk much about hell at all. The word's not there. In the Old Testament, the dead don't go to hell. The dead go to Sheol, which is usually described as a resting place. When you see R.I.P. on a headstone in like cartoons and stuff, that means rest in peace. That whole idea comes from the Jewish Hebrew conception of Sheol as a place of rest, a, a place of sleep, a place where you go when you die to sleep alongside your ancestors, not a place of punishment, not a place of burning, not a place of torment, not a negative place at all, but a quiet place, a dim place, a place that is depicted in the Bible as being way down in the earth, way down, where you finally get to rest from the labors of your life. Actually, that sounds pretty good. Hmm. Conceptions of hell in Jewish thought didn't start to evolve until very late. It wasn't until the Greeks under Alexander the Great invaded and took over Judea that ideas and concepts of hell like we know it began to evolve. The, the concept of Hades was part of the Greek understanding of the afterlife, and Hades was the actual god of the underworld where people would go who were morally corrupt to be punished forever. That was a Greek a Gentile understanding. That way of thinking began to develop amongst the Jews after that. And by the time of Jesus, it had taken on a very physical and yet also metaphorical form. You see, on the east side of Jerusalem, there's a valley, the Kidron Valley, that divides the Temple Mount and the old city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane on the east side of it. On the south and southwest side of Jerusalem, there's another valley, the Hinnom Valley, which is just to the west of the city of David. The Hinnom Valley, also called the Gehenna in the Aramaic of Jesus' day. This was a place where king, the kings of Judah, specifically Manasseh and Ahaz, had offered a perverse form of child sacrifice. And it made the valley cursed and uninhabitable by good Jewish people from that point forward. It was, in fact, it was useless for everything except as a nearby trash pit. In fact, they would burn trash there in Jesus' day, making the place a filthy, disgusting, smelly, and smoking um, hell. And that's what Jesus is saying here. This is the image that Jesus is pulling from when he speaks about Gehenna, when he speaks about hell or what the NRSV translates as hell. It's the, it, it's the Aramaic word being used in Greek, Gehenna. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. Now, let's, um, let's render this with the metaphor as Jesus was articulating it as they would have heard it. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go into the Hinnom Valley trash pit where there's a whole lot of fire. It's better to be one-handed than two-handed and live there. Mm. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. 
It is better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into the trash pit where we have the trash burning called Gehenna. Better to have one foot and hop around Jerusalem than two feet and walk around in the Hinnom Valley. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the trash pit there in Gehenna, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Huh. It's better not to go to that valley. It's better not to go to Gehenna. <coughs> it's better to lose a hand or a foot or an eye than to have all your parts and be there. These extreme references are among some of the only instances where Jesus talks specifically about hell. And it's clear what he's doing. He's not issuing a teaching about hell. He's not using um, this metaphor here to explain the existence and hell and what it's going to be like and how horrible it's going to be. He's not teaching that hell is a place other than that valley. He is saying, he's using this metaphor to say that it's better to separate yourself from these things and these kinds of things that cause you to stumble to be thrown into that trash pit for all eternity. Hmm. Among Jesus' references to Hades can be found the story of the rich man and Lazarus. That's in Luke 16. For the rich man is in Hades, or hell, and Lazarus is by Abraham's side in heaven. The rich man asks God to send Lazarus to give him water for his tongue uh, because he is in agony there in Hades. He's told, no, you had good things in your life. You were rich. Lazarus, who was poor, had bad things. Now you get bad things, and he gets good things. Hmm. The rich man asks God, then, to warn his brothers, to send Lazarus to warn his brothers about the bad things that are coming their way if they end up in Hades as well. And God says that they had the law and the prophets to warn them, and they ignored them, just like you did, and that they wouldn't believe even if someone were to rise from the dead. The point of this parable is not to teach about hell or Hades. It's to make the point that people will still reject the message of God's love even after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus uses commonly accepted ideas all the time to get his point across without necessarily endorsing them. In none of these is he actually teaching about hell. He's using these metaphors to make other points, more important points about life in the here and now, about being receptive to God's calling and God's grace in the here and the now, not as a warning about what's going to happen over there, but instead, listen now. Listen to the law of the prophets. Listen now to what you've already received. Better to do that than to end up in that trash pit or end up in Hades. There are several other biblical references that are sometimes thought of as referencing hell in the Bible. One of the most important of these is the lake of fire, as described toward the end of the book of Revelation, chapters 19 and 20. It's where evil is tossed. And not just evil people, but the devil, Satan, and even death and hell, both personified here. They're all tossed into the lake of fire, where they are consumed eternally. One possible alternative translation for eternal here is totally or completely 
consumed, destroyed, annihilated. Hmm. And that's the whole idea. That starts to get close to the whole idea here. Concepts of hell that we have learned over time mostly don't come from the Bible. Most of these concepts are from Greek culture and Roman culture and European culture, especially from the European culture of the 12th through the 15th centuries and after, actually, from long after, from 1,500 years after the biblical period. Most depictions of hell uh, that are popular today and those that most people like to talk about when they're preaching on it come from the Italian author Dante's Divine Comedy, and particularly its first part, The Inferno. And like much of the Bible, that book wasn't intended to be read literally either. It's a long extended allegory of a person's journey toward God, with the inferno portion talking about the importance of recognizing and rejecting sin. So just like much of the Bible, it wasn't intended to be read literally either. Hmm. So most of our cultural imagery about hell is either non-biblical or misinterpretations of biblical references or misapplications of metaphors and allegories that you find there or far beyond the Bible. Then how can we understand hell today? Do we even want to understand hell today? I, I know I don't. I don't want to spend much time on it. The Bible doesn't. Jesus doesn't. In my opinion, it's an entirely unproductive subject that some have used to try to scare people into the church. And that doesn't work, my friends. I don't believe in a God that tortures people eternally for a finite error, mistake, infraction, or failing. No matter how bad the mistake, the error, or the sin might be, an eternal punishment doesn't equate, doesn't balance, is not truly just in the eternal scheme of things. It just doesn't seem right. It doesn't sound like the same God who would love us so much that this God would come to live among us and give God's self for us in Jesus of Nazareth, in his life, in his ministry, his death and his resurrection. I just don't buy it. I'm more interested in helping people to become the salty preservative people who come into this world to preserve life and preserve love and preserve hope and preserve happiness. The happiness, the hope, the love of the presence of God and the Spirit of God in Jesus Christ our Lord that we have received. I'm more interested in preaching about grace and the calling that we have to share God's grace with all. One of the most important elements in thinking about hell that has been offered for years is that no matter how people have talked about hell or Gehenna or Hades or even Sheol, the lake of fire, the critical part that seems to stretch between them all is separation from God. Being separated from God by your own action or inaction is a form of hell acting as if God is distant, being distant from God. Hell is being separated from God. And an eternal hell might be understood as complete, total, eternal separation from God, which many philosophers say is non-existence. If God is everywhere, 
Is there any place that God is not? So to be separated from God means that you are not. Hmm. Interesting. When something is tossed into that lake of fire over there in Revelation 20, when death and the devil and Hades are tossed into that lake of fire, what happens to them? It's what happens whenever you toss anything into a fire pit. It gets burned to ashes. In other words, it ceases to be. That's that total consumption idea that is contained within that word eternal. Not just a long time, not just for the age, but completely, totally consumed. Hmm. Also, we tend to make life here hell. When we disregard, disrespect, fail to treat with respect our fellow human beings, when we fail to love God and love neighbor, we are contributing to the building not of the kingdom of God, but to a worldly kingdom of hell. We're good at making life hell for ourselves and for others. We, we don't have to worry about going to hell when we die if we're good at making everything here and now into a living hell. And that's what a lot of us are good at doing. And that's the hell I'm worried about. Now, I'm sure that some of those who hear this or will read it, will pitch a fit and try to consign me to the depths of hellfire for daring to deny a burning, suffering, torturous hell. <laughs> Have at it, if that makes you happy. Have at it. I'll take solace in knowing that you're not God and neither am I. Deciding what happens next is way above all of our pay grade. And that God loves me as much as God loves you. You see, that's where it all comes down. The love of God. The love of God that doesn't want us to suffer in any kind of hell. A hell here or a hell forever. The love of God that comes to embrace us to comfort us, to lead us, and to guide us. A love of God that doesn't want us even to have to pluck out that eye or chop off that hand or chop off that foot. A love of God that wants us to live in a relationship with each other and with God that is typified, empowered, and enabled by love. That is the God we know. That is the God we serve. That is the God who's been revealed to us in Jesus of Nazareth who came as a little baby Grew up laughing and crying. Went to the temple and was teaching the elders. Gathered disciples around him and taught. Healed. Fed the hungry. This is the one who caused the blind to see and raised the dead. This one who came to live among us, to teach us, to feed us, to heal us, to forgive us, and to teach us and lead us in forgiving others and feeding others and serving others. This one who then went to a cross to show forth God's love for us all. This one who was raised from the dead, this love of God doesn't leave us or forsake us. This love of God is incompatible with a message of hellfire for eternity. This love of God is the love of God that overcomes even our failings, even our sin, especially our failings and our sin. This love of God which counteracts, which blows away any hell that might be posed. This love of God is what we pray.
proclaim. I'd rather live in the love of God than have two hands and two feet and both eyes. I'd rather, I'd rather have the love of God. Ruling, empowering, forgiving me and us all. I'd rather live with God. The love of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let me dwell. Let's be